What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard of business, it's dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're engaged, and we like to get scared together. We are, t- <laughs> this week we're talking about, I'm thinking of ending things. I realized some people saw us tweeting about that and read the tweet too fast and thought we were breaking up. Oh. <laughs> I no. promise we're not breaking up. That's not the case. <laughs> That's not what this is. <laughs> we are discussing, I'm thinking of ending things. And I'll say r- just right up front, this movie is very heavy. And I, I kind of wanted to even just right away reveal what the entire movie ends up being about. Oh. Just so you can decide either if you, you know, if maybe you don't want it spoiled. Run away now. If, if you haven't seen this and don't want to know okay, anything yeah. about it, just stop now. Or if you, d- you are on the, the fence and you have never seen this and aren't sure if you want to listen to it or not, um, I'll just, you know, give you a big old content warning in about three, two, one. Yeah, this whole movie is overwhelmingly about suicide. Um, I mean, the title. That I'm thinking of ending things, which is kind of a misdirect. Well, that's the thing is I heard the title and I was like, oh, it's going to be about suicide. And then it's the first line of dialogue in the context of a relationship. And I was like, oh, was I bamboozled? And then in the end, no. You were not bamboozled. It was correct. Um, Yeah, it's it's about more than that, but it's very sad, really existential. It is a Charlie Kaufman script. And I mean, the book itself was existential, too. And I read the book (laughs) over the weekend. and it, it's really difficult, but I I spent a few days thinking about it. I ended up, I, I loved the movie. I really liked the book. I wasn't 100% on how I felt about it, but in combination with the movie, I loved it. And I found that my, my takeaway from it's actually been very life-affirming, which is weird because it's very sad. It's a very sad ending to a sad movie, but I... I'm very curious. Yeah, so that'll be the last few minutes as I have a take on it. And it also kind of involves like just Charlie Kaufman's kind of voice in general and what he, like the the threads in his work, I think. Anyway, I I really like Charlie Kaufman too, so that has us going for it. But all right, well, I'll stop rambling. And I'll warn you, this whole episode is going to be rambling because that's what this movie is. This movie is, we can't, okay, we can't talk about this uh, in a linear fashion, it just it just isn't gonna happen. It, this is gonna be all over the map. I think if you haven't seen this, this episode will be like inaccessible. You're not gonna. Oh understand yeah, you're not gonna understand what the hell about. we're saying. And also, it's not a horror movie. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That that can be part of our discussion. And I actually am thinking <laughs> next week. Yeah. Okay. I'll just say next week. I kind of want to have a broader discussion about the fuzziness of horror what is horror and what's not i might even set up a poll online i might put some like commonly like horror adjacent or eh, people argue and have people vote and we'll talk about what the results were and we can give our own yeah so let's let's do that next week okay that'll be fun because yeah this one i would say pretty firmly in my opinion not horror. It is unsettling. Yeah. And there are spooky moments uh, by the fucking ice cream plays. I, that got real spooky mm-hmm. to me. But I don't think it's horror at all. No. Which is I, fine. I the don't think it is, is loosey-goosey. either. And that doesn't mean that I, I didn't enjoy it. I really did. You hated it. This will <laughs> we'll, be another, we'll talk This will be it. another one where <laughs> we're split, which doesn't happen too often. But we... <laughs> I will say after this move, the the credits roll, James goes, I can hear him just exhale. And he goes, oh my God, thank fuck that's over. I'm so, I was dying. I was waiting for that to end. And meanwhile, I had gotten up three times already to go to the bathroom to get tissues to (laughs) wipe my nose with. I'd been sobbing the entire last half of this fucking movie. Well, okay, here's my thing. I need to be honest to how I felt watching this movie. And that honest appraisal is 
that this was one of the least enjoyable movie watching experiences I can remember in recent times. I was miserable. The first hour or so, I was just uh, uh, distressed. It's a very anxiety inducing movie and I was willing to see what was going on. But then an hour in, I just wanted it to be over and it wasn't over for another hour and 15 minutes. It's a two hour, 15 it's minute really long, long movie. movie. It's yeah. a long one. I felt uh, like I wanted to just tear my hair out for the last 40 minutes at least. And when it ended, indeed, I was like, finally. But then seeing how it affected you and having you explain the context of it to me, because I did not read the book. I knew absolutely nothing going in. I just went in being like, what's this movie? Yeah. And waited for it to tell me what it was. And it never seemingly did, at least for my dumb, dumb brain. So after you told me more about it, uh, I, I am actually interested in reading the book and perhaps giving it another watch at some point. Because here's the thing. There are many other movies that I've watched where the first time I watched it, I was either unimpressed or equally confused. And then with further understanding and context, they became some of my favorite movies. I'm talking about both both Egger movies, The Witch and mm. The Lighthouse. Both times I left those theaters, I, I didn't hate them like I did this, but I was like, I don't know what that was all about. And then watching them again with subtitles, uh, enjoyed a lot more. Mandy, I was tired the first time we watched it, and I was just like, what is going on here? It's so funny. You're naming all these movies where... When we watched them together after they ended, I was like, fuck yeah, that shreds. Yeah, that you awesome. usually like them yeah, right off I, the bat. Yeah. Except for my last example and one that I thought of while watching this movie, Mother. We watched oh, that yeah. and we left the theater and I was like, I don't know how I feel about it, but I think I liked it and you fucking hated it. But then on the drive home, we read more about it had more of an understanding. And by the time we got home, we were both that's, like, that movie is fucking dope. That's such a good example. Yeah. Mother was a weird one because it wasn't even <laughs> like, because I think some people genuinely took a big offense. To, I mean, it is it is a, a very disturbing movie. There's some really fucked up shit that happens in it. And I think some people's dislike of it is genuine offense. But mine was just, all right, I don't. You, you said that it was pretentious. Yes. When we left, I, I, and, which is exactly what yes. I said about this movie yeah, when yeah. it ended. So, and I, I love Aronofsky, which, so I was kind of taken aback by how pretentious I found it because I have a lot of patience for Aronofsky. Uh, yeah. Being his, like, The Fountain is one of my favorite movies. That's another one. The first time I saw it, I thought it was really fucking stupid. And then I sat with it, watched it again years later, and it just moved me so deeply. Uh, and yeah, but same thing. It's like after I sat with it and thought about it, I realized, oh, this is like once you start peeling back why you think it's pretentious. So I am perfectly fine saying that my first time watching this movie, I despised the experience, but that I am willing to change my mind based on uh, having more context and understanding of what I watched. Because I think that watching this without any context will put you at a disadvantage uh, I saw plenty of people on Twitter say that they still enjoyed it, even though they didn't read the book or know anything. Yeah, I'm trying to think if I it's it's hard to say because I, I genuinely during the movie was trying to think, OK, how would I what would be my thoughts on this scene and then the movie as a whole up to this point if I hadn't read the book? And that's a hard thing to mentally try and do. And I, I genuinely don't know if I would have liked it or not if I hadn't read the book. Yeah. I think I, mean, I would have liked it less. Yeah, but still probably more than me. Probably, <laughs> yeah. I, I just love Charlie Kaufman so much. It's a, So this, this is an adapted screenplay by Charlie Kaufman, also directed by him. Uh, but his, I would say his most well-known movies and the movies that I came to really like him for the ones where he wrote, but he didn't direct. So like Adaptation, Eternal Sunshine. I didn't realize he didn't direct either of those. No, he, he did not. And uh, being John Malkovich, he did not. Yeah. Or no, I'm sorry. I thought that he directed Malkovich and Adaptation. No, no, I no, knew no. that he didn't direct Sunshine. Right. But he wrote all three of those yes. didn't direct. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Yeah. He, he is um like, he definitely is a screenwriter and I, I saw someone else say this in a review too I was reading people's different reviews and interpretations of this movie and I saw someone say that Charlie Kaufman is a screenwriter where they could 
easily be pretentious, but they have a lot of patience for his pretension because it genuinely seems sincere. I, whenever he is at his most pretentious, I buy it as as sincere and meaningful. I don't think he does stuff just to do stuff. I think there's genuine meaning in every little thing that he puts down on the page, which can be frustrating if you maybe don't give him the benefit of that doubt. I feel like the things that you're saying apply in a less substantive way and a more aesthetic way to Wes yes, Anderson. Yes, I was just going to say Wes Anderson. Because yeah. He, yeah. He, that style can seem very protect, but I think that's just who Wes Anderson is. Yeah. I think that's him being his sincere self. Yes, Even yeah. though it can come off as That's how I feel about Kaufman, too. <laughs> So I think that's why I like his stuff so much is it, it feels very sincere and it's really human, even if it is inaccessible sometimes. Inaccessible and bleak. Like this movie is a downer. Yeah, but again, <laughs> and I'll, I'll say my little piece at the end, mm-hmm. but I, I do think, and again, this comes from being a fan of his other stuff. I do think that when I take into consideration him as a writer, I think ultimately there's something really really uplift like not up- I would say like yeah like affirming in the ending and life affirming and almost optimistic if you choose to read it a certain way I'm like I said I'm very curious yeah so curious let's there. let's get into it yeah, and uh did we mention that it, he wrote the screenplay based on the 2016 yes, novel yeah, by yeah. Ian Reed yeah which I did the audiobook of and Really enjoyed it. It's, you said it's real short, right? It's yeah. The audiobook itself is about five hours long, so That's I did it over the weekend. Be a short book. And it's definitely more of a horror than the movie. In fact, I was actually really surprised when the movie was not nearly as scary as the book. Yeah, is because the book, our main character, who in this is named Lucy, which I thought was kind of fun, but in in the book she does not have a name but in the book that main character suffers from sleep paralysis so she's seeing people and stuff like out she wakes up and can't move and there's a guy standing there and oh yeah and so there's all kinds of creepy it really plays up the atmosphere more and it also is more of a, a plot twist at the end in terms of what the whole framework of the story is, whereas in the movie version, you kind of put those pieces together as it goes along, and there's not really a twist or anything. Yeah, you're talking about the revelation that the janitor who we check in on sporadically throughout the film, you're saying that that doesn't happen in the novel, the checking in on the janitor? No, what it is is in in the book, it's... uh, You get (laughs) scenes with Jake, and the young woman is kind of her... I would say we'll call her. Uh, well, that's what the subtitles. That, that's also true. Call it does call her, her the young woman. Yeah, yeah. So it's those two. It's from the POV of the young woman. So it's in first person from her perspective. Jake is this guy she's been dating for like a month, and so it cuts between chapters of them talking. I think most of the book is like them driving to his parents' house and then stuff at the house. But between those chapters, you cut to these two characters we don't learn their names it's just dialogue so you kind of have to put together what the fuck is going on but it's pretty like they're either police officers or something where they're inspecting the aftermath of the story and they're like how like the fuck did this happen and if you're so the whole thing you're like is is he gonna murder her like what's going on because it clearly ends with something gruesome someone's gonna die by the end and that's when they reveal that the body that they're looking at is of this janitor who worked at this school who committed suicide in a much more violent way too in the book than in the film and that's when you realize they also find his um his journals where he's been writing about jake from the perspective of this girl and i see yeah yeah so it's a bit different yeah in the in the movie we get glimpses of this janitor and you know, I I guessed on my own that it was older Jake, and then that's confirmed when in in the house at the laundry machine, and you see the the clothes, mm-hmm. uh, in the wash. So yeah, there's not that aspect of a twist, but in the end, I was still like, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, 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 I that's fair. I I was reading in an interview with Charlie Kaufman too that he didn't want to do the twist because it it. He's like, it just puts so much pressure on 
you you end up focusing on like let's make this twist audience. really cool and satisfying rather than let's just not even have there be a twist and let's get that out of the way. And now the actors have a space to play in where we're not worried about concealing anything necessarily yeah. and they can act with the full weight of the audience is figuring out what's going on. We're not trying to hide anything from our audience. Like, you know, you can play this to its full emotional capacity kind of. So they're just, they're different. And I could totally see why people... Because, yeah, again, like we said, I we both don't think this is a horror movie, but this has been requested so many. I've gotten so many emails about this thing. My sister actually asked me when we're going to cover it, like when it came out. I was like, oh, I didn't realize it was a horror movie. But a lot of people said, yeah. And I, even when I even tweeted about it, a few people were, disagreed with me and said, no, they think it's a it's a horror. And that's totally fair if you think it is. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. but We'll discuss next week. <laughs> yeah, so... The book is definitely, definitely much more of a horror. I could totally see. Well, it's an, it's adapted from a scary book, and it, you know, kind of gets into like, uh, you know, T two, not a horror movie, but it's a sequel to what is more of a horror movie. Yeah, something like that, sure. Or Aliens, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, if the source is horror, are the offshoots? They're tied to horror at least, you know, if not right. being horror themselves. Yeah, that's yeah. We'll have to. I'm gonna keep mental notes. Uh, we'll talk about this stuff next week for sure. But yeah, so the movie is uh, our cast is fantastic. It's Jesse Je Plemons. Jesse Plemons as Jake, uh, Meth Damon. Back oh, when man. back when he was less known for be for his own talents and just more like, hey, that guy kind of looks like Matt Damon. Well, wouldn't he have done <laughs> shit? I'm trying to remember what all he's done. Was he in a season oh, Friday of Fargo? Night Lights was, yeah, I guess. Yeah, he was married to Kirsten Dunst in Fargo, remember? And then yeah. now they're like together real life. But that was post break. They're together in real life? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, let me, my, let me see if they still are because I love them together. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, no, he was in Fargo and fantastic. Yes, they are presently engaged. Uh, I think they have a little baby too, which I bet is the cutest baby. Aw. But yeah, he was Todd in Breaking Bad. Oh my a God, look bat. at their baby. Look, at he's got a little baseball hat on. <laughs> he just always has that cap on. Aww. He's born with it. <laughs> but yeah, he's a fantastic off, uh, actor. And then Jesse Buckley is the young woman. Uh, I'm not familiar with her, but... I'm not either. I was looking Boy, at her, her other stuff and I... There was nothing where I was like, oh, that's what she's from. Yeah, she's Irish, I guess. Yeah. Uh, did she do some, I don't know, TV work, Sounds stage like work maybe? Sounds like she's done maybe? a lot of theater, like stage stuff. Yeah, so. She's really good in this. She's fantastic. I mean, yeah, no complaints about the acting. No, and I will all. say to her credit, I think that character is really hard to pull off because that character and, and the like when I first started the book, I instantly was like, oh man, is she, are we doing the manic pixie dream girl thing? But okay, weird because we're from her POV, but I don't know. And you realize as it goes on, she's kind of purposely a fan, she's a fantasy construct of exactly. a girl. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that I think is a little confusing is that in the end, you find out that this entire story is a fantasy construct in the mind of Jake, old Jake, the janitor, but the whole movie is told from her point of view with her mental narration that we hear and just everything from her point of view. So that really throws you off if, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever seen that. You see a, a story from one character's point of view who turns out to be fictional and it's actually all wrapped up in the point of view fantasy of another character. Yeah, the like, that's closest... Tough. Thing Maybe I can think club? of is Fight Club, yeah, yeah. for sure. But the, even that, that would be like if Tyler was the first person you meet and you're talking to and is the main character. Yeah, so it's so weird. It's, but yeah, she's a hard character to play because I, especially with all these scenes where, like, she's clearly meant to be an everything in one type character. I think literally, it, it is. She literally is like a meta manic pixie type thing where it, or like just even just like ideal woman in general like beyond that trope she throughout the movie she has said she's she majored in different things and she's an she's artist a physicist a physicist a poet uh yeah a poet, a film psychologist. Critic. yeah yeah she's she's Pauline Kale like she's <laughs> 
all these different things, which I mean, maybe that's, a, but you know, it just seems like it changes and they even changed how they met at one point. It's like, so and everything who, is- who serves what role in the relationship? Because at one point he seems like the movie guy, but then right. later he's like, well, you're the master of all things cinema. Yeah, so the lines start to get weird because one of them will say something and then later it, you realize it doesn't make a ton of sense for that person to have been the authoritative voice on that topic. At one point, she is saying something and tells him, look it up. Very shortly after that, he's saying something and says, look it up. And she says, I hate how you always say, look it up. Mm -hmm. And like, man, I mean, by that point, I was so far done with this movie. But that was an early problem I had with this film that uh, I'd be interested in just letting go of it with another watch is that there is no tether to normality in this movie no the whole thing is weird yeah there's no one character that you can because even in mother you can latch on to jennifer lawrence she is confused by what's going on and she seems to have a normal perspective a rational yeah, perspective and you're, you're like yeah. i'm with you j law i don't know what's going on in this you think that lucy is going to be that character but she she's not consistent at all. None of the characters are consistent in their behavior or, uh, yeah, just their personalities. So there's just nothing mm -hmm. to anchor on to. Everything is just so wishy-washy. And I guess that's because it's a uh, the fantasy of a person dying of hypothermia. Yeah, that's the <laughs> thing is I think if you rewatch it and like, you know, since I had read it, I had the context that this is all one person. Yeah. So... There is a consistency because it is just all the same voice of this one guy. And once you start looking at each character of either different aspects of their personality or just, you know, how like you imagine conversations to yourself in your head, you're rewriting stuff as you go along and, and coming up with different versions of how something, you know, it's all just non-tangential and weird. And that's kind of what this movie feels like. Mm -hmm. But not having that context, it's like, oh my God, there's nothing I can grab onto here. Yeah, I yeah. totally get it. <laughs> Hey, want to talk to you about our sponsor this week, Keeps. Hair loss prevention, prescription medication delivered right to you. Yes, it gets delivered right to you. And you don't even have to go to the doctor's office to get it prescribed. You can get treated right from home, which especially right now, it's a good idea to try and be safe and stay home whenever possible. Keeps will help you do that. So I think near the beginning of this episode, James said that he was so frustrated that he was basically ripping his hair out well. James has been taking hair loss prevention medication, so luckily that hair is still hair that's going to grow back. It's been working really well. He's been taking medication for a few years, actually, and it's amazing how well it works. And Keeps offers generic versions, too, of all the medication you can get prescribed, which is great because it's the same as the patented version. Keeps' treatments start at just $10 a month, but if you want to try it out, you can get your first month free. That's right. Right. Go to keeps.com slash dead meat to get your first free month of keeps. That's K E E P S dot com slash dead meat. Our other sponsor this week is HelloFresh. So I think while I was growing up, I had this idea that once you're an adult, the magical just age of being an adult, you somehow get it all together and you just magically know how to keep up a house and cook and have a job and do everything you're supposed to. That's not real. I've been 30 for a little bit and I, it's impossible to just have everything done by yourself. And that's why James and I get HelloFresh. We actually just added some more meals to our delivery service. That wasn't even part of our ad deal with them. We just added more because it's so convenient. We don't have to plan dinner. We don't have to spend time agonizing over what sounds good to both of us because the meals they send are so great that you, you don't have to think about it. And I'm always excited to eat whatever is on the schedule for the night. And now they have easy eats, which they have even quicker recipes. There's oven ready stuff and 10 to 20 minute meals. The normal ones are about 30 minutes, which still isn't a ton of time, but 10 to 20, that's pretty fast. So if you want to try HelloFresh, you can go to hellofresh.com slash 10 dead meat and use the code 10 dead meat for 10 free meals, including free shipping. And one more time that is HelloFresh.com slash one zero dead meat 
Use the code 10DEADMEAT for 10 free meals, including free shipping. HelloFresh. Most of this film is long conversations between characters, ones that can feel very tedious and at some points, very pretentious. The Pauline Kael thing we'll, we'll talk about. Yeah, so we'll bit. talk all about that scene. Yeah. But it kind of eases you in because the first stretch of the film is them driving to his parents' house. And it feels normal still, or at least more normal during this early stretch. And you just think that this is going to be a story about a relationship. It's a young relationship, seven weeks or something like that. And yet she is thinking of ending things, even though he's a real nice guy. And, you know, it, I'm watching it. And I'm like, I don't really like her. He seems like a great guy. And then by the time they get to his house, it's flipped and he's he's weird. But even then, the conversations are are meandering. And um, <laughs> it's it's so hard to describe. Yeah, and I think the movie... Like, if you didn't already feel uncomfortable or think something weird was going on, I think when she starts reciting the poem, which in that moment she says it's her poem, it's one she's been working on, but it's the poem Bone Dog, which is a poem that exists. So that's an actual poem. Yes. That's the other thing is this movie relies on uh, art and poems and Pauline Kael film criticisms. And I, I mean, I kind of learned about Cal in college, but that's about it. Those other things I have no basis of knowledge of. So maybe if you were aware that that is a pre-existing poem, that might clue you in earlier. Although later on at the house, she's in his room and starts to read from a book of poems. And it's the poem that Attributed was to hers. the actual author. And similarly, yeah. she finds paintings that she had shown as her own, but are pre-existing works by actual real life artists and at that point it's like oh what's going on here <laughs> right yeah and th when she's doing the poem she's staring directly into the camera yeah and it, it's really unnerving there's also this one shot that i wrote down because i thought it was so weird and i think it's right before she starts reciting the poem and it's like her nervously looking out the back of the car window like the the back seat window behind him he's driving and like the camera Passes oh, and the she car. almost sees it. Yeah, I I kind of took that because I noticed that while I was watching it, and I just kind of took it as maybe the weird awareness of, I mean, someone is technically watching them if mm -hmm. it, if the if Jake who older is is creating this fantasy space and is maybe watching it from outside of himself and looking at the car, just the idea that even in my head, this character's creepped out. Yeah. Because that's another thing that that isn't, Um, I don't really remember. Again, I did the book and the movie one after the other, so that's tough now to parse out what happens and what. Mm -hmm. But in the movie focuses a lot more on this runner that I think is interesting, where Jake, I think, is really afraid of other people finding him creepy or off-putting, especially women, because the whole thing is he the, this Lucy or this character he calls Lucy we find out that she is the mental fantasy of this woman who he just saw once at a bar and was too shy to talk to her and give her his number and that's it and he like basically beats himself up for not just going for it but then kind of copes with it by imagining their relationship inevitably failing you know oh but I would fuck it up anyway kind of thing but he so there's that I think he he kind of mentally focuses on she probably just thought I was creepy and even in his fantasy she's like yeah you're you know that's like asking me to describe a mosquito that bit me or something like how could I describe you know remember what well even then uh or, or um when she's describing their meet up to his parents she does describe him as like being off-putting. Yeah, she mocks him a little. Like even, yeah, he can't help himself from letting this character mock him, I think, because he's so insecure about the way that he comes off to people, especially women that he finds attractive. I think he's really concerned that women are, are just, yeah, put off by him. And so he can't even let himself in his head And have... also that's like, that's such good casting with Jesse Plemons because he's not a traditionally attractive like movie star looks 
kind of guy. No, you know? yeah. He's like, not like, uh, he's not Tyler Durden and who could walk into a bar and no one's going to, I mean, I guess you could find Tyler Durden creepy if he's acting a certain way. Sure, but yeah. he's, it's Brad Pitt. You're you going to be more receptive perhaps. <laughs> sure, yeah, to, yeah. yeah. And especially <laughs> as someone like that character gets older and becomes the age we see him at the end, it's like, that's where I think it carries over from being concerned as a young man that women my age find me, you know, oh, the creepy guy at the bar to he's this janitor who works at this high school. And I think we I think there's a genuine concern that he comes off as creepy to the the female students at his school because we see uh, he he pauses to watch them rehearsing Oklahoma, which is a big runners musical. Another Oklahoma. thing that I didn't have the background sure. knowledge on. <laughs> uh, and when they kind of see him watching, I think as we we see like a girl who's rehearsing get kind of the uh, mm-hmm. and there's the girls at the ice cream store who are kind of almost mocking him and making fun of him, and he's trying to kind of avert his eyes. I think I think genuinely this character struggles with being the creepy old man and how much it hurts when he realizes that's how people see him. I think especially because he's a janitor, we so unfairly assign things like that to people like janitors or people who work like oh, jobs yeah. like that we it's, you know the, cre- the creepy janitor the creepy is a trope janitor, yeah for sure and so i think the fact that we then get inside this character's head and realizes he's watching the kids rehearse every year because he cares about them like he's he deeply cares about the students he talks about how he he always notices the kids at school who are having a hard time and he sees them years later when they've grown into adults and he can tell they carry that it's like that in like the reason that he looks at students and and maybe is caught staring is because he is like cares about them. He cleans up after them every day. He's like this invisible person that comes in and takes care of their mess. And that is a very caring thing to do is cleaning up after someone. He probably it's weird. I feel like he probably learns so much by just the things that these students leave behind and probably gets attached in a weird way. And I think that's also where the they have that kind of debate over baby, it's cold outside, which is kind of, which is funny because that's such an over debated thing. And yeah. I love that now when you realize it's just him arguing with himself, it's just him arguing either side of it, which is, is so that funny. also in the book. No. Oh, it's not. It's not. No, <laughs> that was that was for this. But I was going to say but in 2016, it was discussed. But like by 2020, we've got it. I think it's so, like it, like <laughs> knowing where it's coming from, though, as this older guy character is so yeah, funny. That's true. Yeah. The fact that he pays attention to the discourse and <laughs> also he, it's like there's that. And then she, when she's sitting alone, she's saying like he's not that like something about he's not that creepy about Jake. Like it's a weird moment where she's saying kind of like like reaffirming to herself that Jake is nice and not a weirdo kind of it's I it kind of like went by so fast and I'm just scribbling notes furiously that I maybe missed exactly what she said and then the third thing is when when they're about to start kissing in the car Jake thinks he notices someone watching them and he's like oh I I know that look I know what that means there's someone watching and that's creepy and you know I I think that's almost him in the present or at least to me, that represents Jake mentally beating himself up for maybe staring or getting caught staring and maybe, you know. Like at her in the bar, perhaps. Yeah. Or, any or, other occasion. or even like, you know, getting caught staring at a student, even if it's not intentioned like that, knowing that that's what the student thinks and beating himself up for doing that in the first place. Mm-hmm. I think he carries a lot of guilt with him in terms of how he makes women feel and how much that hurts when he, you know, he knows how he knows what his intentions are and he knows that he's good and has good intentions. And, but they don't know that. And yeah. That, that sucks. I that's think that's really hurtful. That's yeah. a, a really interesting theme to talk about that maybe doesn't get discussed enough. The, the, the plight of the self-aware guy who knows that, you know, uh, due to just history, women can sometimes feel uncomfortable. And like, it's that whole like, hey, I'm, I'm not creepy. And then like that comes yeah, off as it's, creepy. Yeah, it's like that's the tweet where it's like, my t-shirt that says I'm not creepy raises a lot more <laughs> questions than it answers kind of thing. Where it's like, okay. It's, yeah, so that's- uh, Yeah, for oh. sure. I think, and yeah, it's, again, especially because- 
he's a, a janitor. I think Charlie, because I, I don't think this is a, a thing that's as present in the book, but Charlie Kaufman, I think, really plays with the idea of the creepy old janitor and how much baggage that carries with it on its own. If you're the night janitor, you come in, peop- immediately you're the creepy old janitor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that, that's sure. like how sad that is, that that's what he is to most people that he's around every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're in that car for so long, having their conversations, reading their poems, and then they finally get to his parents' house. Oh boy, the parents' house. Yeah. yeah. Before they go inside, they go around and just kind of look around the, the farm and there's like a dead, there's dead frozen lambs. And he, I thought it was so, uh, kind of, there's some dark comedy. In yeah, this there's some movie very for dark sure. humor in this But movie, yeah, yeah, she's like, how did they die? And he's like, I don't know, but they're, they're, they're frozen through. No worries. Just like the no worries about the dead lambs was interesting to me. Yeah. And then he talks about the- It's interesting. The, they, the lambs froze to death too, knowing what happens later. Yep. Don't worry about them. They're fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, then he tells her about the the pig that they found just being eaten alive by maggots when they moved it. Yeah, that's and in that the pig book comes back. too. The story about the pigs is in the book too. And that story is such a standout weird moment because it's so fucked up and the imagery is really awful yeah he talks about how there's these these giant pigs that live in the barn and uh they kind of just lay there in the corner and so it ended up that the the dad would come in and toss their food in and just leave you know they're fine whatever uh but he realizes one day oh well they've kind of just been laying here and not really touching their food, what's going on. And then he rolls the one over and it's, yeah, it's being eaten alive by maggots. It's dying while, you know, it, it's still alive and just slowly being devoured. It's it's really disgusting, but like that scene in the book just, gro- it grossed me out. And I it just, for me at that point, provided just kind of mood, like just imagery, atmosphere, like, ugh, creepy. But now seeing it again the second time in the context of I know what, is going on here is the saddest shit I've ever heard. Like it broke my heart the way he talks about these pigs. And I think that's why the pig comes back at the end because I think ultimately the pig is like the best representation in the book of what Jake feels like he is in this. It's like the most uh, dire representation of like where he's at mentally. He is the the pig in the the corner that you, he gets checked on. He gets the essentials to live. Uh, people see him every day, technically, because he goes to work. and But he doesn't have anyone in his life that actually cares about him and interacts with him. His parents have both died at that point. He doesn't have a partner. He doesn't have any friends. I'm pretty, you know, he doesn't have anyone. So he really is, the he's the pig in the barn who it just exists and you know well he's alive he's showing up to work check down him great but nothing besides that there's no emotional care there's no interaction there's and he's being slowly devoured from the inside out and because everyone's just kind of you know grazing by him and just check you know there you know and not doing any further investigation they have, no one has any idea that He's going through that. Until they find him dead. Exactly. Until they roll him over and he's being, you know, so it's like, like the second time I realized what the story of the pigs was supposed to be. And it just, oh, it just broke my heart. Yeah. I, I, if if you have the patience for it, I'd recommend this a second time because it really is heartbreaking. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean. Very curious to, yeah. to reappraise It's a it. lot of movie to watch again. <laughs> That's so, the thing, yeah. It's so long. Uh, shorter than Wonder Woman. So. Yeah. <laughs> he also, at the same time, they, uh, him and the, the girl talk about how humans are the only animal that can't live in the present, which is true. And I think about all the time the fact yeah. that- Other animals aren't aware that they're going to die. Yes. They're just living minute by minute. Whereas yeah. I think they said that humans, because we uniquely- know our eventual fates uh that's why we have hope yeah that's why we've invented hope hope. Mm -hmm. it's why we've invented the idea of things to look forward to and that's when jake kind of also um i don't know if it's at the same time but he talks about how we come up with the 
the platitudes of, oh, it'll get better. You know, it's always darkest before the dawn kind of shit, but, you know, because humans have to do that because we're, yeah, again, we're the only animals that are self-aware like that. And uh, yeah, it, it totally reflects how hard it can be when you truly feel you're like at rock bottom and there is nothing to look forward to, especially for this character like him. I think he's very purposely an old man where it's like, I'm an old man. I have no one. It, like I the 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 empty platitude of oh it's it's gonna get better someday doesn't apply you're gonna tell me no like that it's not like it's not I'm mm -hmm. you know I'm old I'm past my like there's no there's nothing and that's like the bleak it's it's so bleak and yeah. it's it's again really rough it's why I wanted to, to warn you up ahead before we dove into this episode but um yeah it also I I thought of this quote by uh um. Weirdly, Darren Brown, who I as a, a magic artist, I don't even, I don't even know if he likes to be called magician, but he's a he's a, <laughs> a mentalist too. Yeah, he or magic performer. He has a book uh, about anxiety that I just got, but he there's a quote in it. Um, he talks about this this fear of of dying and fear of death, and his he says something to the to the effect of awareness of death is just the tax that we pay for the gift of being self-aware. It's like, it sucks, but that's the price we pay to be able to be human. And mm -hmm. it's it's just an unfortunate price. It's, it's the trade-off, you know? It's That's just how it is. And, and uh, yeah, and the actor himself, Guy Boyd. Is, <laughs> he's so good. He's so good. And he is a 77-year-old man. And, I you just, you just want to give him a big hug. Yeah, those thoughts are definitely going to be on your mind yeah absolutely they finally meet his parents after they kind of take this tour of the the barn and they go inside and i love the set decoration of the house it's i like so that creepy. we get to see the layout of it a lot there's some uh you have a good understanding of it and then later there is a tracking shot that kind of goes throughout the rooms and it just makes it feel more real real lived in yeah this this house feels born in which i really appreciate especially because i think you can tell this house where they filmed i mean if they found a house that looks like this that's cool but i think that they did put up some wallpaper and make it look pretty it's kitschy it's like everything and it's old and like almost too old actually in the book the main character um because it, it takes place now she has a cell phone with her she has a cell phone in the movie too mm -hmm. but i think in the book she more often points out like Everything here feels almost too old, which it would be if if he is imagining himself young now dating a girl who like they both have cell phones and shit. But he's also imagining, OK, well, we're going back to meet my parents like I would have gone to meet my parents 30 years ago. Yeah. So his ago, parents yeah. would be their house would be old as fuck looking, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I think that's such a nice touch and a nice consideration I think could have been really easy to overlook. But even all the wallpaper is kind of ripped up looking. And if they did put it up themselves, they wore it down when it looks really, really cool. I, I just get very excited about thoughtful set dressing. It's easy to decorate a place, harder to take the time to think about the characters' lives and how it would affect the things you put in that room. Yeah. Like one of my biggest set decorating pet peeves is cars or even technology like but but cars i always notice this if you do a movie that's set in like a specific year so if i make a movie set in 1995 all Don't the cars outside cars. no yeah exactly people are gonna have cars from the late 80s yeah. mid 80s it's gonna be varied anyway <laughs> the parents are played by tony collette mm -hmm. of hereditary fame and you know lots of other things obviously and david thewis Fucking Lupin? Yeah, he's I mean he's in lots of other also in things. lots of other things. I I love David Th David Thewlis is so good in this. I he's Thulis. been in he's been in other Charlie Kaufman stuff. I don't know if Tony Collette has, I'm blanking. Um, but they're both so good. God, they're good. Again, more anxiety. They're just like anxiety fastballs thrown into this movie. Tony Collette, especially, just as this like manic really manic yeah laughing and giggling to herself and just like just shaking with energy god but like it's all obviously a fragile front to her own insecurities or internal problems that are going on it is 
It's a lot. Dude, they all go to sit down for dinner and we're oh, just man. like, oh no, <laughs> buckle Tony up. Collette. Tony Collette's at the dinner table. <laughs> Shit's going to get fucked up. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, this is one of the most uncomfortable. This is probably the most uncomfortable scene in this movie is this fucking dinner scene. Because it there's so much going on here and there's a lot to unpack. They got a dog. Oh yeah, Jimmy. Jimmy but you only see it just shaking nonstop. I wasn't sure what to make of the dog. There's a few things I'm not sure what to make of. That, I mean, I guess because the dog is long dead. Maybe he just has a few memories of it. One it of might literally is, just be shaking. he has memories of it from when he was a kid and can't remember yeah. a ton about it. Because even there's, there's even a shot where she's like, where is Jimmy? Oh, there he is. And she like goes to pet the dog and then it's the uh, a camera like facing her as she crouches down to pet, and you never see the dog during that interaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, he just like runs away before you even see it. So yeah, it's like he doesn't have the proper um, comprehensive picture of this dog to fill in at all stages. The also the the other thing that I don't get is her phone. Mm. She keeps getting phone calls from Lucy or other names that she is referred to throughout, and then. When she answers it, it's the voice of a guy who we see in the very beginning that of the, the movie. That was the janitor. Oh, that's the janitor, yes. like in an apartment, in, in yes. his apartment? Yes. Okay. That's him. Okay, I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, I thought yeah. he was just like mysterious shadow man. Who, no, okay. no, no, that is him at the beginning. Because, uh, yeah, that is his apartment. Um, and Yeah, it's him kind of calling her and talking to her through... Okay. Yeah, it that is like a big. That's one of the first things you learn about in the book is he's he's just called the caller, and he's more of a. The caller is more significant in the book and is more of a creepy thing. That is like, why is this coming from my number? Mm-hmm. Who's this guy who in the book is making his voice high pitched to sound oh. like a woman, and it's really weird. Oh wow. Okay. So it's like, who the fuck? <laughs> so it less. That's less of a. Uh, thing in this movie it's more of like a creepy detail i was kind of surprised at how little he did with the the collar Mm. but yeah Uh, i think that's also why he had to give lucy her name so that it would show up on the phone because the creepy thing is in the book is oh my god this is coming from my phone number but how do you communicate that visually that's her phone number yeah yeah, without her saying that line so yeah yeah. uh He, he calls her lucy and then she gets a call and it's from lucy right they uh, so they talk a bit about, at the dinner table, they talk a bit about what Lucy does. This is when Lucy says she's a painter and she's showing photos of her paintings and their landscapes. And uh, we find out Jake used to paint. And that's when David Thula says a very funny line, but I'm realizing a really poignant line, especially when you essentially, I think unknowingly said a version of this at the beginning, which I thought was so cool and confirmed to me that this is exactly what's going on here with this dialogue is David Thule says, well, oh, so you you paint like, you know, landscapes and stuff. And she says, yeah, but I they're supposed to be kind of evocative and they're meant to invoke feeling. And he's like, well, how 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 is a field sad? How am I supposed to? know that a picture of a field is sad if there's not a sad person in it. And it's, which is a very good question. But yeah, <laughs> David Lewis does not like abstract no, art. he does not. But he, yeah, he asks, well, how do I know this, this field is sad if there's not a sad person in it? And I love that. I had the thought that this is kind of, I think almost what the movie is. Like, how do I even know what to feel if I don't have a character to like tell me what is going on or what is sad about this or what like the when you were talking about how am I supposed to know what is real in this or not if I don't have a main character there Mm -hmm. how am I supposed to know the field is sad if I don't have a sad person you 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 need a main character to tell you how to feel right because um, if you don't you're how you felt watching this you feel kind of anchorless and it's like I don't know what I'm supposed to be feeling right now Mm -hmm. and I think that that's kind of the point almost you you're the movies the field and there's no sad person to attach yourself to even though there is but it's like you don't know who that is yet and it's all very abstract and weird but that's the point is of course a picture of a field can be sad and you don't know why you're not quite sure why but something about it can evoke 
intense feelings, whether it's color or lighting or something. And that's, I think, the experience a lot of people have said they had watching this movie is not quite understanding what the fuck happened, but still feeling very sad. Yeah, for sure. It is a sad movie, and the ending of it is sad, and I, you kind of do piece together who your sad person in the field is supposed to be, but it's it's not so clear on what you're supposed to take away from it. And mm -hmm. it's almost more of a mood piece. And I think that starts moving into the type of film that is really hard to get into when maybe you're not used to watching film that isn't linear or is not experimental. Because there is a whole you know school of film where the idea is like, it doesn't really matter what the story of it is. It's, it's just how it makes feelings. you feel, yeah. right? Yeah, and I think that's kind of what this is, although there is very much a story here, but that almost doesn't matter. It's more incidental than, yeah. yeah the, mm -hmm. the, it's not the purpose anyway. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah, oh, go ahead. This, this whole uh, scene is, I think, perhaps the saddest because yeah. she starts jumping through time pretty much and seeing the parents at various ages, including very old at the end of their lives, uh, the father with dementia, unable to remember things. They've labeled everything on the door. And just like, yeah, seeing those characters jump around from, uh, you know, middle-aged housewife cleaning up after a young child to on her deathbed. It's just so, yeah, it's, it's heart-wrenching. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is just Jake going through his different, like the different uh, ages that he's, been with his parents or lived with his parents. I get the sense that he lived with them until he was pretty old, I think, because I, th I think he moved out after they both died, and that's why he's in that apartment we see earlier. But sure. I think he did live with them for a very long time. And um, he, I think, almost is jumping through the, their ages because he's trying to kind of mentally place what, like the vulnerability of having a partner with you for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like the vulnerability of not just introducing a partner to your parents, but then if you are in a serious relationship with someone, that person is there with you for whatever happens between you and your parents or to your parents. It's like, that is really weird and difficult to share, especially if you already have a really fraught relationship with your parents. Although I think we we see that he does love them and, and they do love him. And he is talking with Lucy at one point and she says like, they're, you know, they're good people. Like they have their issues. We can hear them fighting in the kitchen in the scene. They have their issues, but they clearly care about you. And that's the important thing. And he thing. tries to, to raise them. And she's like, yeah, everyone fights with their parents. Right. So yeah, I think that's him internally being like, yeah, I had a good relationship with my parents. Yeah. Like, and that's what you, it's like every, every parent on this planet has fucked up at some point. We're all yeah, human, we're all like people. parents fuck up. That's just what life is. And I think it's it's him. Yeah, he's. I think he's struggling with that. And I think ultimately he kind of comes to the conclusion that yeah, like they weren't perfect, but I, I love them and they love me and that's fine. And that's what matters at the end of the day. At a certain point, I don't want to forget to talk about it because it's the weirdest fucking scene and it made me laugh really hard. We cut back to kind of our present day, like real life framing device and Jake the janitor is watching this movie yeah. during a break or something and it's this rom-com. And at first we're just seeing it on the TV, but then it cuts to the movie. So we're just watching this other movie for a little bit. Like a waitress named Yvonne <laughs> who is trying to do her job serving someone and there's another customer who's like, no, this woman's amazing. I love her. And then she gets fired. And then they're sitting outside. She's like, did you say you love me? <laughs> you dummy or something like that. Directed by Robert Zemeckis. Directed by Robert Zemeckis. <laughs> Made me laugh so hard. And in an interview with Charlie Kaufman, he said that basically that wasn't even scripted. <laughs> but they, I think his assistant director came up with the idea. And they couldn't think of a funnier name to put there besides Robert Zemeckis. And they're like, Robert Zemeckis is just the funniest version. Even though they said that that movie is nothing like he would ever make. No, it's, it's more just, like a Nora Ephron movie yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, but Robert Zemeckis <laughs> is just so funny. Um I also, I was thinking more about that movie within a movie too. And there's something like about that also where like the main character is like 
is Yvonne, who I think, you know, on purpose looks like his fantasy woman. At one point in the car later, she even replaces Lucy for mm-hmm. a single line of dialogue. And you're like, wait, that's not Lu- that's Yvonne from earlier. Yeah. And then it's back to Lucy. <laughs> and Lucy, as much as she represents an ideal partner, she also kind of represents this idealized Jake because she is like, she's so smart and like, like she has majored in all these things. Like she That's rep- why they go back and forth yes, on all yeah. the things that they're supposedly experts of. It's like, oh, he's really into poems like Wordsworth, but then later she's the poet and yeah. can write poems. I think she kind of represents like, like, there, like as much as there are many versions of Jake that he wishes he was, there ultimately is one Jake that exists. And then I think she in this other person just represents all of the other things he could have done with his life and all of those possibilities. And by imagining them as another person, it almost feels like more realistic almost. Or it's like like he has all these casual interests and he's imagining her as a partner who has taken those casual interests and has uh, excelled in them and has perfected them and uh, like is an expert in those topics because when she's walking around and uh, the parents are getting older and everything, she goes into his childhood bedroom and we see all the things that they've been talking about. There's a book of Wordsworth mm-hmm. poems that There's he was Pauline familiar Kale with. There's a Pauline Kale book. Pauline which Kale, is, which that will, comes in later. Comes yeah. in later. And uh, what was the third thing? There was also uh, the, the you said the poem already. Yeah, the Wordsworth There's a copy, poems. there's a DVD of A Beautiful Mind that comes in later. Oh, which, yeah, I I, I didn't catch I that, did not that catch that the... either. And I'd see, I've seen that movie, but I just, it's been so long since I've seen it. And it's also just the, the poem that she uh, claimed as her own. Yeah, Bone, Bone Dog, Dog is it in like, there. Like, that's in his room, so yeah. So there's it, just everything that Lucy has either claimed to be her own or even just like other things you may not even realize are lifted from other stuff that happened. Oh, a, there's a book on virology there. Um. So the, yeah, the reason I bring all that up and why I bring up that he has this like fantasy version of himself is it's in the scene in the diner, there's the guy runs in and is like, you, oh, she's not just a waitress. I'm imagining so he's fantasizing someone runs in. He's not just a janitor. He Aww. is this and this and this. He's amazing and I love him. And that is so, like, it's so sad. <laughs> Guys, I cried so much during this movie. <laughs> like, up- like, do you realize how, like, having the context yeah. is, like, devastating? <laughs> the other thing with that and the fact that he's watching that movie uh, in in the school as the old man janitor, and then later that story becomes their new story of how they met. It changes from mm-hmm. he saw her at a bar to she's a waiter who waited on his table. I think that ties into the other thing that we discussed uh, yesterday or whatever about there is a conversation that they have at one point in this movie about how people are simply the things that they consume, the yes. media that they consume. And so that's why he is talking about Wordsworth because he has read the Wordsworth. Uh, When they're they're back on the road after leaving his parents' house, he like sings the whole Tulsi Town ice cream Mm -hmm. song. The scene that I felt was the most pretentious and uh, just (laughs) I couldn't fucking stand it is the scene after they've left his parents' house and they're talking about uh, what's the movie? Oh, a woman under the influence. A woman under the influence, and she starts to criticize yeah. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And goes on a very long, sure. very specific rant about right. why that movie's not good. Yeah. So here's the here's the thing with this movie is, as much as we can delve into all of the references that are made, I'm sure we're missing a ton. This mm-hmm. movie is a fucking enigma. Like it, it you need like you could spend hours untangling this thing and. I don't. I. I honestly think at a point it, that's not even the point. I think the references, if you get them and understand them, enhance what's going on here. But I don't think they're necessary because I don't think Charlie Kaufman would want you to think they're necessary. Uh, but this part, yeah. She, I think this part benefits. From yeah, <laughs> I think this could have been. This part could have been shorter. But she, Lucy, starts giving this, her take on this movie, uh, this Cassavetes movie, and she's talking about how, oh man, I w- did I even like put the, the quote? I have so many fucking notes on this thing. <laughs> uh, basically, she word for word um, 
quotes this review of A Woman Under the Influence by Pauline Kael. And that review was is like an infamously like bad review of a, a critical movie. Review. Or yeah, an, yeah, sorry, an inf- yeah, an infamously critical review of a movie that is loved. It's critically it's 90% acclaimed. Ninety percent Oscars. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah, it's a it's a it's a huge huge movie. And there's even other references to that movie, like the the thumb motion, like the yeah, like that's a that's like a yeah. I cool. figured yeah, because that's so, she does, it and they're like oh yeah we'll yeah yeah the yeah yeah and. I was an interview I read with Charlie Kaufman. He was saying that that scene kind of is like the culmination of what you were just talking about, that kind of anxiety over, oh, my God, am I an original person or am I just a collection of things that I like? Mm -hmm. Do I have any original thoughts at all or do I just reference things that have already been thought? Yeah. Yeah. I I feel that. Yeah. (laughs) And like as people, we we review movies for a job, we don't tell original stories like that's mm-hmm. not what we do that is an anxiety we both have and we have discussed <laughs> yeah. this a lot and that's i think an anxiety a lot of you know analysts and theorists have reviewed because it's like you, you don't feel like you're actively creating anything you don't like do i have an original thought when am all i I'm, making anything yes, of when value? all i am thinking about are the things other people have already done yeah and so this charlie kaufman said that this review when he saw a woman under the influence, he loved it. And he also loved Pauline Kale and, and grew up reading her reviews and really respected her. And he he read her review of that movie, which is terror. It's like she hates it. And he said that that was such a like an important, weird feeling of like just second guessing your opinions on stuff and second guessing how you feel felt watching something like your experience consuming something like is my experience with this movie right (laughs) is it's just like you the anxiety of like oh am i wrong for having felt a certain way watching something am i emotionally weird for not being or am i dumb or am i yes or am i stupid (laughs) for not he even says yeah i think he's he's like that's a big part of it is feeling stupid when someone you respect has a vastly different opinion than you on something and that's like a weird vulnerable thing Mm -hmm. to go through and decide oh just kidding do i actually also hate this thing or do you stick with your gut and you think that this person you respect and maybe would have otherwise like cribbed some opinions from or been influenced by do you decide no they're i think they're wrong it's that's tough it's yeah um so i think that that scene serves a definite purpose and it also is like meta on another level because a woman under the influence is partially about like the it's like a singular person base you know basically mentally deteriorating and the movie kind of deals with like the the unjust world and like what even is crazy relative to the you know the world around a person and it the anxiety of reuniting with family because the family reunion is a big part of that movie that goes horribly wrong and the weirdness of that. And so like, yeah, on another meta level, that Mm -hmm. movie deals with a lot of the same things that we're dealing with here. Man, there's like, again, this movie (laughs) is like, it's too much. There's too much to talk about. Also, I didn't realize that the actresses playing the workers at Tulsi Town play students at the high school. Yes. So I believe the two laughing at him are the two in the, I think the first scene we get with the janitor, he's walking down the hall yep. and there's girls and they're, in the, <laughs> they're yeah, laughing like, hey, at, him. at him. Yeah. And then is the third one who who talks to Lucy Moore, is she the one in Oklahoma? He, or? I don't know if she's in Oklahoma, but he definitely sees her when Jake in the car, uh, as, like Jesse Plemons is talking about, yeah, I see some kids at the school. I can tell through their, that they're going through oh and then that's that's, why at Tulsi that's why she's she's like like, i like you you're nice and i I wish you wouldn't do this you don't have to go and you don't know what if you don't know what she's talking about you're like go where what the Mm -hmm. fuck meanwhile i'm sitting behind you (laughs) sobbing into our cat because (laughs) the student that he cares about and i think on some level knows that he's watching out for her is the one who is pleading like you don't like you're kind and that should be enough yeah it's so sad 
Uh, so, you know, they've left the parents' house. They've stopped at Tulsi Town to get their, their burrs, their ice creams. Mm-hmm. And uh, then it starts to melt, which is a very, for me, that was like a horrific image, the melting ice cream <laughs> You know, getting all sticky. Yeah, and... it was awful. So he says, oh, I can pull off to my old high school. And so we're going back to the high yeah. school, which now with all this context feels as significant as Dr. Sleep going back to the fucking Overlook to yeah. me now. And this whole it. scene too, this this kind of final drive back to the high school, there are shots of Jesse Plemons where the window keeps getting more and more obscured. It's like frosted over and shit. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure at what point in oh. the story that he is sitting in his car freezing to death, but mm-hmm. I think that's what's Probably going close, on. Yeah. It's either literal or it's like you know him getting further and further to the point of no return right where like mentally there's no coming back from it yeah jesse plyman's the side of the car just gets all fogged up and kind of weird looking yeah they share a kiss uh which we mentioned before the one time that they actually kiss Mm -hmm. in this film and then he goes into the school looking for the person who he said was uh watching them Uh, eventually she goes into the school to look for him on her way in she Sees a dumpster full of burrs. Mm-hmm. Any insight on that? Um, my initial take. I think I even wrote down that I think the uh, well, one. I think him being like, oh, I don't know. Should we go dump the shakes somewhere? Should we not? I think that's the the debate over. Do I, mm. you know, end it or, uh, yeah, the ones in the dumpster. I think either. Um, to me, signifies the f- like him being a creature of habit. Yeah, that's what I, was I just have. I just have this mental image of like he goes and gets one of those every day, every day on the yeah. way, and he throws it in the. And so that's his mental image of like, yep, I do the same fucking shit every day. Throw mm-hmm. this thing in the. But I saw someone else online interpret it as this is how many times he has fantasized about this routine. Oh yeah, and and like how many times he's thought about actually doing this. Yeah, and considering it, but hasn't and done it. Gets it gets that far. And yes, which is it's near the end now. Mm-hmm. and maybe just stop. So I think that's either, Jesus. I like that read on it too. Yeah. Yeah. She goes inside and actually talks to old Jake, the janitor, looking for young Jake. Oh God, this is what I was <laughs> weeping. James. Because like she hides from him too at first. Like she's afraid of him, just mm-hmm. which feeds into, you mm-hmm. know, that image problem that he has of how people perceive him. They see him as the creepy old janitor that they might need to hide from at first. But he's just a nice guy who offers her his slippers again. Yeah, the Jake slippers. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, Jake offers his slippers earlier. Also, I think I noticed, I, I couldn't tell. I think when the car is parked outside, is that an Eternal Sunshine reference? That overhead shot? They, On the it goes ice. back to the It shot. goes back to it a couple times, yeah. but I wasn't 100%. I would probably say yes. Sure. Uh, he, um, she asks if he has seen her boyfriend around, and he asks... Uh, old janitor Jake asks her what he looks like and she says it's hard to describe people and boy that <laughs> I felt that because I have always thought like if it, if I was ever a witness to a crime and ever had to like help a police I wouldn't be able to help them at all I'd be like what's he look like I don't know he's got eyes and a nose and a mouth I don't understand how police sketches work and it baffles me yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> you'd be the worst w- I mean like would would you even have to go into witness protection? I don't know. Because you can't, like, you generally didn't see anything. <laughs> yeah, right? Just like, no, no, no. You don't need to worry <laughs> about me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so she says, well, actually, Jake and I are my, we've never actually even talked. And this is when we learn that mm. Lucy what if if at this point maybe you're thinking was she like a past girlfriend what like what's going on here this is when we learn she was never she she wasn't a past girlfriend at all she literally is just this girl that when jake was young he saw in a bar once and did nothing happen he just kept he was looking at her and he must have realized he creeped her out and that's it that's what the only interaction they had. Yeah. And that's when she says, like, I don't know how much, so, like, that would be like asking me to describe a mosquito that bit me once. Like, I don't, you know. Yeah. And that's when I think, it's like she, that dialogue feels so out of character for her at that point. And I think it's almost just like mentally, Jake can't 
help but let that character talk to him like that because he just is feeling so shitty. Because it's him previously, being like, no, that this this is just a fantasy. Yeah, because happened. previously Lucy is like a very validating character. Like she, even if she disagrees with him, she's never like cruel to him. Like they, especially when they're, uh, yeah, like that scene with his parents, she's like, no, 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 like you, you, you know, your parents love you. And when he's like feeding his mom when she's really old, she's she like, you care about them. And that's really, you know. It's remarkable yeah. because she is talking about, and especially she has some conversation before that about how society discards the elderly, yeah. which he is now right. at this point, and she makes a very good point that it's a, such a short-sighted, stupid thing for us to do is to ignore and discard the elderly when all of us will be that one day. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. and But of course, you know, this is all his fantasy, and he, like you've said multiple times, is can't help but put himself down. That's why in that scene with his mm -hmm. uh, parents, his mom says that he was a guy with no special talents or abilities, just... The only thing he had was diligence, which yeah, is why he has a little diligence, diligence pen. Badge, yeah. 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 Like, I think the mom is, represents like that kind because that's even part of going back to that fucking movie, Woman Under the Influence and the Pauline Kale review. In that review, Pauline Kale talks about how tempting it is to blame everything that's wrong with you on your parents. And mm -hmm. um, that, oh, yeah. that role often gets assigned to the mother and that Lucy says something to that effect too. It's like internal criticism. And, how t and that I think the mother is purposely putting him down in that scene because it's, you know, it's it is his. tempting to, you know, oh, everything that I fucked up and everything that went wrong with my life, well, it wasn't my fault. It was because like my mom raised me this way and she made me feel bad about myself and mm -hmm. fucked up. But, but. yeah, I, th I think it's so sad that he, through his mom, says that the only thing that he's ever been good at is diligence, literally just living. Yeah. Just like, because now he's an old man and he's thinking back like, oh, I never did anything good I mean, except if, for get old. If you're that in that deep and you truly think there's nothing for you, what, what is the only thing you have done except I made it, I'm alive right now. Mm -hmm. Great. That's my accomplishment is I've lived to be this age. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Oof. But at the end of the scene with, with Lucy, he gives her his slippers and, you know, they, they hug and that's when she she says bye and, you know, starts walking to, I think this is when she finds Young Jay. And this is when they become the ballet dancers, yeah. right? Okay. So <laughs> in, all right. So you've never seen Oklahoma? No. Okay, which that's I feel tough. like would yeah, also help. Um, so film. Oklahoma, and like I haven't seen it in a while. I saw it when, I, weirdly, my high school did it. It was after I graduated. My sister was in it, so I went to go see it. And like I've listened to the soundtrack and stuff as a kid. It's like Rodgers and Hammerstein. I don't love it. I don't love Oklahoma. It's fine. <laughs> Um, I do like the version with Hugh Jackman. If you want to watch a version, he plays Curly, and it's really good. Um, but in that musical, it's it's kind of like a love triangle thing. You have, I think, is is it Lori is the girl? I think it's Lori, Curly, and, and Judd. Man, let me make sure I get those names right before the musical theater. <laughs> People they will come yell at me. upon you. They do. They're sure. shivs and you'll yes. have to pull out Lori, red ribbons. Lori, Curly, and Judd. And basically, I think the end of Act 1, uh, lo so Lori's like the cute, like she's our, our main lady character. And she at this point um, has agreed to go to this dance with Judd, who is the like kind of scary, creepy farmhand who lives in like a cabin on the property. And he, I remember when I saw Oklahoma, I was like, what the fuck is with this character? Cause this character, everyone in the musical is basically like, dude, no one likes you. You should go kill yourself. Like that literally is the, which is like, you know, I think why like the janitor sees himself in that character. Cause he's just the weird dude. And everyone's like, Oh, like, you know, might as well just kill yourself. Cause you suck so much. Um, so, but like Lori has agreed to go with Judd to this dance and she has like a dream and she, in her dream, there's, it's the dream ballet, right? That's the thing is she like, uh, imagines, I think marrying Curly. I can even just read the fucking Wikipedia synopsis of the dream ballet so I don't fuck it up. Okay, here we go. Um, she takes opiates because <laughs> it's the 1800s, <laughs> dude. Start. What else are we doing in Oklahoma sure. on the prairie? I would do so many drugs if I lived in the 1800s. It'd be so boring. Uh, 
Uh, so, okay, she she first dreams of marriage with Curly, and that's young Jake in this. This is Jake, like, he's handsome. He's this handsome ballet dancer. He's got the plaid shirt on, and it's clearly supposed to be, like, young Jake where his whole life is ahead of him. There's, like, all these, you know, open options waiting for him. They have, like, a little wedding. Her dream takes a nightmarish turn when Judd appears. That's the janitor. Janitor Jake appears mm. and kills Curly. She can't escape him, confused by her desires. Awakening, she realizes that Curly is the right man for her, but it's too late to change her mind about going to the dance with Judd, who arrives, and they leave for the box social, which is, like, the dance. So I think it's, it's like, it, we see that happen, too. It's like the janitor Jake and the young Jake get in a fight. And young janitor Jake. Young janitor Jake. <laughs> Which is a new one. <laughs> yeah, they get in a fight and he stabs them. And it's it's snowing. Like, the ballet part of this is very cool. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah, the dance. It's I mean, gorgeous. by this point, I was fucking just so anxious for the movie to end. But I could even stop and appreciate this is a cool dance. It was, it's so cool. You <laughs> guys know, all know how I feel about interpretive dance in a movie. <laughs> it's like this, uh, Us, Annihilation, please, more oh, interpretive yeah. dance finales, please. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so I think it's kind of like, I think it's two things. One, it's, I think him, like, fearing that anyone who ever loved him, if he fell in love at a young age, Ultimately, he would pr probably still just become this janitor and whoever he ended up with would realize, oh, no, I'm stuck with this monstrous, jan this cr weird, you know, this this dead end guy. And it's too late. You know, they've killed the young. There's no like the guy I thought I was with who had so much ahead of him. This is what he's become. Mm -hmm. And the anxiety of like, you know, if he ever did have a partner, which is something clearly he wished he had but I think he gets in his own head and thinks like well it would have ended anyway which is why I think the whole thing of the movie is he, he it's Lucy saying I'm thinking of ending things it's him re like reasoning out that well it all it all would have ended anyway because who would want to be with me mm -hmm. right um even if they met me at like my prime I'm I'm just gonna be me, and that's gonna be you know. It's what's the thing about where it's like the 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 joy of being loved and like the terror of being known or something like that. Or it's like there you know it's you want to be loved, but being known is terrifying. But it, like being having a partner around for all of your worst shit and mm. getting to know the real you is terrifying and vulnerable, and it makes you you know it's easy to second guess like why someone is even with you know like you can get in your your own head so easily about that yeah and i think that's you know what this is and i also just think it's him realizing like because it's it's Lori realizing like well it's too late i have to go to the dance with judd i almost think it's jake realizing like no the real me the one that i i at my core know who i am is this Jake, like I'm Jake. I'm the I'm a man who is many things and I, you know, I'm full of possibilities and interests, but I, I'm not just a janitor, but it's too like he's already maybe been in the car for how many hours or he's already made the decision he's gonna stick to it. It's literally it's too late. He is going with the janitor. He's he's going in that, you know, he he already decided I'm going to the dance with Judd, I'm I'm going to end it. I am the janitor. I this is who I am and who I've decided. This is what defines me. And yeah, there's like no turning back. Yeah, I think is what I took from that. Yeah, and that's why I was crying this whole time. <laughs> well, yeah, because after that scene is when the janitor like finishes up his shift and goes out and sits in his car and doesn't start it. Just yeah, sits in it and. Uh, yeah, at the very end, through the credits, you see that, in fact, his car is covered in snow in that parking lot. So he did just stay in there and he uh, froze freeze to, to death. death. Yeah, but you even Lucy at one point when Jake leaves to go throw out the shakes and he doesn't come back for a bit. She's like, she's like, fuck, it's freezing in here. How long would it take to die of hypothermia? Yep. You so know, he's wondering, like, thought. that's how he could uh, how but, he could go. Yeah, uh, in in his mind, at least. 
We see him strip his clothes, which is a symptom of hypothermia. Yeah, hy what... it's like the last stage of hypothermia. Your some signals get crossed. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but your body for some reason thinks you're overheating. Mm -hmm. So often people have been discovered having like frozen to death, where yeah, they're naked. naked. And I think originally people before we knew that is what happens to you. People assumed it was it. People have been like sexually assaulted. Oh. So there's a lot of like miss um, like like crime or not crimes where it's just scenes of someone who's frozen to death but they're like mistaken for a crime scene mm. when really it's just no our brain goes weird and we we take off all our clothes when we're dying of hypothermia it's very bizarre but yeah but he does that and then in his mind follows an animated pig the pig from the farm mm -hmm. uh who we have discussed earlier he kind of a metaphor for himself yeah the pig even says um Shit, I don't have the quote, but the pig is basically like, you're me, I'm you. Yeah. Something to that Which effect. is also a quote, uh, similar quote to Lucy earlier. She's talking about like, where do I stop? And he starts, mm -hmm. which is an earlier clue as to like what's really going on. Yeah. But he follows this this pig through the school. The pig uh, maskin is, is nudity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and eventually what he just... Walks down the hall, and then we we get to that last scene where Jesse Plemons is in old man yes, makeup accepting oh an award. Yeah, it's the end where Jesse Plemons is on stage, and everyone in the audience they're, they're all in this like yeah, his, almost like kabuki. Yeah, makeup. it's like it's just stage. It's old age stage makeup, like yeah. really fakey looking. Because yeah, Lucy's there, his parents are there, the kids, the kids from the are, yeah, it's like every character from the movies there. And he is doing this this the scene at the end of it's uh not it's a beautiful mind just a beautiful <laughs> a mind beautiful mind <laughs> uh, where yeah I forget what the exact context is it's been like a hot minute since I've seen it and again that's the, that movie is like the curse of being the smartest man alive and that's discussed in the book actually there's a whole conversation about the the curse of what being the smartest man in the world would be and if it's even possible to be the smartest man in the world because what even is smart mm -hmm. um and that's why i think throughout this movie there's jake will like internal like in his own head be correcting like character like He's maybe even insecure of having parents that he thinks are maybe not so smart. Oh yeah, when um, he's correcting, he corrects them and gets genius. angry, mm -hmm. and it's the curse of being a, a clearly like well-read and intelligent person like he is, and not how, having anyone to share that with, and how much of a burden that can be. Yeah, I think that's a big reason that a beautiful mind is the thing kind of being referenced here, but. which is another instance of someone being something that they reference and that they consume the media they yeah consume. it's it's another it's yet another reference to something and he also sings um the song from oklahoma i uh which judd song is that it's a song yeah oh but, lonely room but no lonely room is a a really beautiful song i think that's jesse plemons actually singing i'm not sure if it, if it is or not i let me I see i couldn't tell yeah because i wouldn't i would not singing. be shocked for a second if it turned out he had Dude, a musical theater i wouldn't background. be shocked either you know he's is a very talented guy singing i'm not oh it is apparently yeah yeah great <gasps> i really i love him well i mean we got a lick of it earlier when he was singing the tulsi town song <gasps> yeah. so yeah <laughs> oh man you know what Ooh, i am now realizing because i i think that into the Woods live action was okay. It had really good moments. Mm -hmm. I would, he'd be such a good baker. Yeah. Like what, just read, of Corden? <laughs> just redo it and put him in there instead of Corden. And then have him do the song with the dad, which is like one of the best parts of Into the Woods and it's not in the movie. Anyway, um, yeah, so he sings the, the Lonely Room song. Cause that is kind of, yeah, it's like the janitor, you know, Judd lives in this little, Shack by himself. He must identify with Judd a lot. It's really sad. Yeah. Judd's a weird character. He's a very weird villain. Well, you know, I guess watching Oklahoma will be more homework for me before I do a rewatch of this movie. Just to fully I'll watch it with I'll watch the Hugh Jackman one with you. <laughs> so uh yeah. That's the end of the movie. And that's funny when I I was you know, immediately after the, the movie ended, I was I just looked online at other people's reactions. When I, when I looked at this movie on Twitter, a lot of people said, I cried at this and I have no idea why. <laughs> and I think that goes back to what we were talking about. Just like, how do I know this is sad if I'm not sure if it, like what mm -hmm. did I watch? Lots of people, like so many different theories and, and takes on this too. Some people 
uh, I think someone who responded to me on Twitter thought that this was like an allegory for that it really truly was from the woman's POV and he was like an abusive boyfriend or something. I just I feel like there's a lot of if, if like you have a take on this, there's plenty of things you could make into evidence and in because the, there's it's like such a cipher, you know? Yeah. Um, on that note, I would love to hear your uplifting interpretation. Yeah. So I I was thinking that like, you know, like this this movie's really sad. And I guess this will be like the wrap up to this episode because I don't even know how much more like there's so much more we could talk about, but we're going on an hour and a half here. Yeah. <laughs> uh this this movie again is is a puzzle to put together and really rewarding if I think if you do both the book and movie. Um I I, I loved it. But yeah, I think this movie is really sad. It's it's two and a half hours of this guy justifying to himself why the only option he has is to kill himself at the end of the movie. Like, that's what it is. And I think I want to wrap up the conversation about it just so we're not ending on that note. Um, yeah, why well, I ultimately think that there is like an uplifting, affirming message hidden in here. And it, I think it's because I when I think of who wrote it, Charlie Kaufman, I immediately thought of another movie he he did, and we still need to watch this together, so I won't spoil it for you. I won't give you too much context here, but um, I, I love the movie adaptation. I That movie just, like, shattered me when I first saw it. I thought it was just so stunning, and there is a scene in that that really moved me where... So, so in that movie, and this is not a spoiler, this is the setup of the movie, Charlie Kaufman is himself, mm -hmm. Played by Nicolas Cage. Char Nicolas Cage plays Charlie Kaufman, who is writing the film adaptation of a book by Susan Orlean. Um, it's extremely meta. And in this movie, Charlie Kaufman has a twin brother named Donald, who is not a real person, but who is also played by Nicolas Cage. Um, and who basically is this fictional extension of Charlie, if that sounds familiar at mm -hmm. all i i think that that could be a very good sister movie to this one because there is almost a similar thing going on here at one point donald tells charlie again no context but he says you are what you love and not what loves you and in that movie that quote ends up meaning a lot to charlie kaufman the character and i i think in the script, I think he feels the same way about Jake. Cause like we talked about, yeah, he he's a guy who he loves a lot of different things. Like this whole movie is made up of references to things that this character enjoys in life. And he has anxiety about that. But ultimately, we still as an audience come to understand Jake as a fully rendered person. Like we have empathy for him. We're not He's not a character who we discuss is like, yeah, he's this guy who ultimately is he even a person. He just likes a bunch of stuff like by the end of this movie. We're, clearly, we're both affected by what happens to him and the way that we see this character talk about himself and the way he he regards himself. And we see the good in him. It's like as an objective viewer, he that character might feel unloved or know that he doesn't have anyone. But as an audience, we can clearly see that he is a guy who loves art and poetry and philosophy and all these really cool things. He cares for his aging parents. He cares about the students that he watches at school. Every, you know, he watches them grow up, essentially. He's a thoughtful person and he is what he loves. Even if no one loves him, you're supposed to feel devastated that the only option this character has is to, to do that because it's so clear to me, at least as a viewer, that he is someone worth being loved. And it's tragic that he feels discarded. And he, even that one character says, you don't have to do this, you're kind. And yeah, he is kind because he demonstrates that in the things that he loves and cares about and discusses with this fictional person in his head. I guess that's what I wanted to emphasize is like, you know, if this episode was maybe hard to listen to, if maybe you feel like 
Jake, maybe you empathize with Jake and that's a really hard place to be in. And I'm not going to give you the same platitudes that someone like Jake hates where it's like, it will, you know, it'll get better. And it's, you know, I'm not, I don't. Silver lining. Yeah, yeah. silver lining. Yeah, that kind of, you know, because when you're feeling like that, that all comes off as condescending and hollow. And to, to talk about horror in the way that um, we, you know, we find interesting and that if you're listening to this, you, obviously you find interesting is understanding how fear affects people and understanding like why horror is effective through like a really human lens. That's really special. You have to have some basic awareness of the humanity of others. And it, that might sound like a bare minimum, but I, you know, I don't think it would be shocking to uh, realize that not many people can do that, you know, is the desire, have that desire and curiosity about what's going on in someone else's head. And understanding especially like what scares people because that's so deeply human and deeply primal and we come at it on our show from an angle that's really you know I would say sympathetic and uh human and you know I, so I think bare minimum the fact that you know you're a fan of of horror and you're a fan of it in that way and you enjoy analyzing it like that that should tell you a lot about you I don't know you listening to this probably but I I don't know. I, would you agree with that? Yeah. I think that's what I'll leave you with. I think that that's something you can hold on to at the very least that I can objectively say, yeah, you know, that's something about you that I think is very, very cool. And I think, you know, right now it's a very easy time to feel lonely and, you know, just I, I think it's an important time to, yeah, hold on to that idea that you are uh, what you love, even if you feel like you're alone um, think about the things that you love and find important. And I think you'll find something very revealing about yourself and really special. And here comes Lucy. If we took, you know, your interests and your passions and your humanity and splayed it out and people could see it. And I'm sure a complete stranger would watch that movie of you and think, oh my God, like, of course, you, like we can't, afford to lose this mm -hmm. even if you don't think there's anyone in your life like jake doesn't have anyone in his life that knows that but we but as an ob objective audience yeah watch him and his life and his interests and are like no you you are right. worth it yeah exactly all right next week let's do yeah let's talk about what it, even horror is <laughs> yeah so i'll do like a poll or i'll we figure should do a thread of polls like this movie and then options Oh, yes, that's horror. a good and, idea. Yeah, just the thread like on, on Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll so, do that. Uh, on that note, make sure you follow Chelsea on Twitter at Carebeck. Yeah. C-A-R-E-B-E-C-C. -E -E mm -hmm. That's usually what you say. Mm -hmm. And then you're Debbie James. Yep. On Twitter and Instagram. That's right. Uh, the store's closed right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll have that back up later. Oops. Uh, we'll have it back up later. Yeah. And uh, deadmeatpod at gmail.com uh, for all the nice things you want to say. Yeah. So... We'll be back next week yeah. and hope that you found this podcast as insightful as I did. How do you, how do you, how are you feeling? I think you are brilliant. Oh. I think you, I think you sold this movie in such an effective way that after having what I described as the single worst movie watching experience of recent memory, I want to watch it again. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> so. Damn. No, I think that you uh, are wonderful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> your humanity and, and love for this depiction of humanity is infectious. And I love you. Mm, thank you. <laughs> so I'm blushing. <laughs> Bye-bye. I'm ending the podcast. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>